Hello and welcome to our State of Affairs 2 portion of the program where we're joined by Mr. Phil Hill from the American Voices Abroad. Phil, welcome to the program. Thank you. Tony. Could you tell us a little bit about what the American Voices Abroad is, we what their goals are, uh -huh. and how they're going to achieve those goals? <laughs> uh, the last part's probably the hardest, but... Um, we are a group of Americans living in Berlin and in other cities in Europe, by the way, but uh, here in Berlin we were formed uh, at the beginning of last year at the time when the Iraq war was uh, in the offing, starting, uh, you know, threatening, and uh, we were basically Americans who had lived for the most part here for some time and got together to form an organization to oppose the war and continued then uh, during the war and in its aftermath and now we're focusing somewhat on election year. So in terms of what, what our goals are right now, uh, we aim to mobilize people. We're a nonpartisan organization so I've got to be a little careful of uh, exactly how I frame this, but we're, um, we're not supporting any particular political party but we do support candidates who support our agenda and our agenda is uh, the uh, abolition of the Patriot Act, the repeal of the Patriot Act, um, and also the uh, abandonment of the doctrine of, of preventive war, which was the doctrine you know, under which uh, the Iraq War was, um, was initiated. Uh, so we support candidates who, uh, or we, what we were trying to do is get mobilized people, mobilized people all over Europe Americans who live in Europe or who live outside of the United States to pledge to vote and to pledge to vote for candidates who support that agenda. So on the one hand we're trying to just register people to vote because we believe that the more Americans we register the m abroad the more that agenda is going to be served and secondly to get them to pledge to uh, support that agenda. And I think there's a third item on our agenda now, too, and that is to make sure that this election is clean. In, 19, in, in the year 2000, as in the year 1876, the Republicans pulled a coup, and the Democrats had won the election in both those uh, elections, and the Republicans pulled a coup and uh, took over the government. Um, and... and uh, the elements for that happening again are greater now than they were in the year 2000 for a number of reasons. Well, without being partisan, suppose we talk about the principles that the American mm -hmm. Voices uh, Abroad espouses. Mm -hmm. How would you define what principles are the basis or the philosophical basis for the work you do? Well, I mentioned the two items that we have passed kind of formally at our meetings. And this is not just in Berlin, but in all the other cities in Europe where similar groups exist. Um, and we had a big convention last 4th of July, and we passed that resolution. So that's official, as it were. Um, but let's say if you're getting into philosophy, the philosophy of it, I would say that what we're about is a, a world that runs on the rule of law and not that runs under the dictate of the United States. And that separates us from the policy of the current government of the United States. But we believe, and I think that it, the fact that we're living abroad gives us a different perspective from, you know, than some people might have who, who've never been outside the United States, gives us a perspective, you know, that we are just people, you know, like other people, 
and not any better because we're Americans, but we live in their country and uh, we like it here, you know. But um, if we don't, we can always leave. But uh, you know, uh, but we are living here with these people that are, you know, from their own countries and have their own uh, democratic systems in, 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 at least here in the case of Germany and in many other countries, and and. These countries have a voice in the way that the world is run, and they should have a voice. And there has to be a, a, a system of, of worldwide democracy that we at least have to move toward, and a rule of law that says that, that, you know, that tries to replace the, the rule of force and the threat of war as a way of dealing with international issues. And that is uh, kind of the philosophy that's behind what we're talking about. The, the people that you had on just ahead of me who were talking about the landmines. This is a very, you know, they didn't say it, uh, um, unfortunately. They just sort of mentioned that there were some countries that didn't, you know, that were very important who hadn't supported the landmine treaty. One of those countries, of course, is the United States. And, and it's this uh, sort of philosophy, well, you know, we run the world, and, the, and, and if we didn't run the world, it would be terrible. And, we need our military to run the world. If the military wants landmines, then they get landmines. That's the philosophy that the current government operates under. And we say, no, that people suffer, people die, people are crippled because of this worldwide. And we want a different system where the people who are the victims of this also have a say in how the world is run. Maybe they w would rather not have to step on landmines. So when foreign policy is determined by a country's self-interest, how do, how do you suggest that that point of view is balanced with a cooperative and rule of law sort of uh, structure throughout the world? When we see sometimes that agreements are made and laws are made, but sometimes uh, some countries seem to overlook those or forget them momentarily. How do we handle that situation? Well, it's a difficult question because, you know, obviously you have to handle it um, at every level of human society. You know, you, you can see kind of that human society has been moving toward, you know, ever greater coordination. And we were talking about globalization now and the so-called anti-globalization movement. Uh, they have said, hey, wait a sec, we're not against globalization. We just want a different globalization. And, and I, I think I, I agree with that, I, you know, that we need uh, to get to the level that where there is a, a globalized democracy. Um, how, do we, how do you do that? You have to build the elements. It's difficult because it's like almost pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, but you have to build these elements. You know, the UN is just a terrible organization. It's corrupt, it's ineffective, and so forth and so on, but it's all we've got, you know? And, and so you have to strengthen the UN, you have to reform it, you have to improve it. You have to uh, use some of these other mechanisms like the, the, the um, landmine treaty, but you know, there's other ones that are of a different order of magnitude like the, like the climate treaty, the Kyoto Protocol, or, or the international um, uh, court of criminal, uh, international criminal court that's been set up. All of these are things that the United States has not signed on to. And claims to be a world leader, but all of these are elements where the majority of the world's people, through their governments at least, are saying this is what we want. And this, these are elements where by such a, an international rule of law could gradually be built, and where the United States under the current government is, is, is blocking that. How do you address the issue of an organization such as the United Nations being in the position that it is de very dependent for a lot of its sustenance uh, with the powers uh, that to some extent you are objecting to in the way that they behave. How can they uh, be more efficient when they really can't make the decisions for themselves? Well, yeah, yeah I, that's what I'm, I said something about pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. How is that going to work? Concretely, um, I think that there are uh, that there's a difference between the powers that you, you're talking about. I mean, um, you know, I don't think that this country is perfect or its government is perfect, but I think that 
you know, I was uh, extremely happy to be here and not in the United States at the time that the war started. Um, maybe I should have been ha preferred to be in the United States to fight, uh, you know, in the belly of the beast or something. But, uh, you know, it was just, it, it was pleasant to be here among, in a society where, like, everybody was opposed to this war and the government. I mean, I marched on the 15th of February on that big demonstration. And I marched, you know, right next to a member of the cabinet of Germany in the demonstration. And, uh, you know, that's not something that's likely to happen to you in the United States. Um, and, and those people, th th this government actually supports in a much more consistent way these elements in favor of the rule of law. Germany is the motor behind the Kyoto Treaty worldwide, the one country that is really pushing the Kyoto Treaty, not only diplomatically, but in concrete terms in, 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 you know, of, of the major countries. Um, and, and there's other countries that, uh, you know, big countries that in other ways can contribute. And if you can kind of get all of these different forces in the, United, in the world that are like China, India, these are huge countries, you know? And they're countries that are developing a civil society that is very... Um, important and very powerful from the grassroots. And, you know, if you could get the, these different forces, some of the Europeans that are more enlightened, uh, the emerging countries in Africa, um, you know, the, these big countries in Asia with their civil societies and so forth, you know, and I could list a whole bunch of others, but, uh, you know, if you could form a critical mass here together with those of us in the United States who are taking another look and seeing, you know, we are not the be-all and end-all of this world as Americans, you know? then I think that, uh, that we have a force that can start setting a new agenda and, um, you know, and start setting up these institutions and reforming those institutions, especially around the UN, which are extremely um, negative or, you know, need, need reform. Well, just before we uh, go to break, uh, you're going to share the uh, 19th Black International Cinema from yeah. May 6th through 9th. You will be there on the premises. Yes. And also there's a seminar that the uh, American Voices Abroad will conduct at the Humboldt University. So we look forward to working with you with and you. Uh, other... We're going to uh, co-conduct it <laughs> with the Democrats. And as I say, we are yeah. nonpartisan. We are two organizations. We and the Democrats Abroad are going to be running this together, but not, uh, you know, one of us. <laughs> we just happen to be two organizations that are doing this together. <laughs> Phil Hill, thanks for joining us here Thank on The you Collegium. Thank you very much for having me. So stay with us, and remember, you are participating in The Collegium. I say to you today, my friends, that in spite of the difficulties and frustrations of the moment, I still have a dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a desert state, sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by their color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. 
Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous peaks of C California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. I had a dream when we let freedom ring. When we let freedom ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, we will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And welcome to our State of Affairs, part three, with the very distinguished Ricky Riser. Ricky, welcome to the Collegium. Thank you. I had the pleasure to work with you a number of years ago, and I've never forgotten how well organized and uh, the vision that you showed and the way you got that organization with the Black History Month uh, Committee and, and, and presented that, uh, that, that uh, was a three-week, four-week uh, program in February. I've always admired your work, so it's a pleasure to see you and to work with you. Yeah, that was interesting times, that's true. But um, uh, I changed a little bit. Of course, I saw it costed me too much energy, mm -hmm. and I got into health problems, and I had to reorganize myself a little bit better. Well, since that time, which was two or three or four years ago, a little mm -hmm. bit longer than that, actually, what have you been doing, Ricky? I see your wonderful work behind us, and I've had the pleasure to see your artwork. So what else have you been doing plus that? Well, I've done a lot. First of all, I've been unemployed, so I did some schooling over the Arbeit and got me the international driving license for computers. Good. You can rest. No, go ahead. No, it's no time to rest. I found me a job. It didn't work too good. Uh, so I tried something new. I got deeper back into my art again. And you know, I got a daughter who got a disability. And I take care of her. And um, I still work on Afro Look. And I, I founded a black calendar. You probably heard about it. And besides that, I started to work on a book list from black authors. So I'm still quite busy. Well, tell us about Afro Look. I remember the magazine. That was a pretty historic undertaking on your part. Well, um, Afro Look was founded by a number of Afro-German students like Chona Muateng, uh, Russell Green, and some others. And uh, when they got deeper in their studies, they hadn't had no time for the magazine no more. Mm -hmm. And when I joined the ISD in 1989, I saw something I couldn't let lay there and nobody took care of it no more. So I said, let me try. We was a group of four people and started to, to do a rebirth. Um, at the beginning, it was quite simple and easy, and we was a good team, but, well, then some problems followed, people went their ways, and I stood there with my, my Afro look then. Well, in the meantime, between time, I learned how to deal with a computer, I, I learned how to do some layout, and so on and so on. So I kept it running to the end of 1999, then the money ran out. So I had to stop it. 
Well, what about your artwork and uh, the silk screen, the beautiful work we see behind you? Tell us about that. How did you become involved with it? And uh, what is your inspiration on your, or your vision that leads you to create these kinds of works? Well, um, I always say it, when I run out of words, I got to find another way to say what I want to say. And uh, years ago, I found my interest back in painting. I never been studying art or something like that, but I always was interested in art. So I started to try and try and show and try. And well, first it was paper, then it was canvas, then it was wood, in between was silk. And well, I love these different materials. And where do you work? Do you have a workshop or do you work at home? Or how do I you do wish this? I would have, but I'm working in my living room. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any port in a storm, anything yeah. that works. Well, uh, if there's no other possibility or you can't afford it, there's only one choice. Either you do it where you can do it or you don't do it at all. Do you also give classes? Or do you have students, or do you, or how do you handle that? No, I have been doing two times classes with children, uh, bringing it to the point of African math schools. Uh, I've been talking to some Afro-German children, and one little girl told me, "Well, uh, I like African art, but some masks scare me really." And I said, "Okay, then." We do something different, let her create or let the children create their own mask mm -hmm. so they don't fear these traditional masks no more. Right. That's interesting. Now, where do you find the materials for these? Do you, do you make them or do you buy them or how do you assemble the, yeah, what you need to, to make this happen? Well, this is all silk scarves. Okay. They plain white. Oh, okay. And. Uh, then you can buy colors, and, and sometimes I mix them, sometimes I just leave them plain. And then I put on what I want to have on, and then the color game starts, and this is the most interesting thing on it. And when, you, when you're working, do you work on one project at a time, or are you like some other artists who work on two or three, and they have an inspiration for different ones at different times? No, uh, I love to work uh, quite fast. And I work on one course. Um, I'm afraid of too many different influences mm -hmm. in one thing, or that two, two or three things get the same influence. I want to keep everyone fresh and special for itself. Well, your, your exhibition, some of your work, is at the Click Film Theater now yeah. and will be there until May the 9th. Um, I definitely want people to come and see some of the masks you're describing. And are some of your works for sale, or how do people contact you? Uh, they are for sale, sure. Uh, and uh, to contact me, I prefer that they, I think you put my phone number in it, and uh, I got an email address. And if somebody want to talk to me about buying some pictures, it would be nice. Ricky Reiser, it's a pleasure to see you again and to have you here on the Collegium. Thank you. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Okay. It's my pleasure. So stay with us, and remember, you are participating in The Collegium.